This episode of Self Helpless is brought to you by BetterHelp. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Self Helpless. I'm Kelsey Cook. I'm Delaney Fisher. And I'm Taylor Tomlinson. And today we're talking about EMDR, which if you don't know, is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing which I did not know anything about until this episode. So yeah. I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah, seriously. Um, it's a psychotherapy treatment that was originally designed to alleviate the distress associated with traumatic memories. Yeah. This is going to be a very interesting one. Before we get into it, should we kick it off with a quotable? Let's do it. Yes, please. All right. Another one from Brene Brown. Because uh, wasn't the last episode we did a couple of We're Brene's? We're doing a lot of Brene's. Yeah, look at A lot of Brene's. BB. All right. Uh, sometimes the bravest and most important thing you can do is just show up. Mm. That's so nice. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's yeah. like words in a blanket. Yeah. You know? Just yeah. go. Just, just go. Just do that thing. Yeah. yeah. Just go there. Beautiful. We love Brene Brown. God, <laughs> if somebody has a connection to Bre Brene Brown, please <laughs> yeah, tell please her, email her that we want her to be on the show. So bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure so nobody bad. else is asking. I know. And yeah, she yeah. has plenty of time. <laughs> we, we just, we want it for her more than yeah. us. Totally. It'd really help her career, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she needs us. Her. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, all right. Uh, should I get into it here? Yeah. yeah. So during EMDR therapy, the client attends uh, to emotionally disturbing material in brief sequential doses while simultaneously focusing on an external stimulus. EMDR therapy uses a three-pronged protocol. The past events that have laid the groundwork for dysfunction are processed, forging new associative links with adaptive information. Number two, the current circumstances that elicit distress are targeted and internal and external triggers are desensitized. And number three, imaginary future events are incorporated to assist the client in acquiring the skills needed for adaptive of functioning oh that's interesting i don't wow. know that my because i've i'm the only one here who's done emdr therapy and i don't know that i've had that in my sessions which one number three the, um, future events. yeah the future events are incorporated to assist the client in acquiring the skills for adaptive functioning huh. i mean i guess maybe that's talking about like the therapy that follows that i mean typically when i've done emdr my therapist afterward has been like, okay, just take a walk and kind of like reacquaint yourself with the world mm. and, you know, take all the time you need. She usually asks me beforehand, she's like, do you have to go anywhere? Do you have to do anything? Do you have a show tonight? Because we shouldn't do it if you got to do stuff. Yeah. Um, and then maybe like later on, it. She, she. I feel like she takes more of the approach of like, you know, you. Uh, this will like kind of help over time. Like you okay. may not know right away how it's helping. Mm. But then, like, mm. as time goes on, you'll kind of, like, come to realizations or you'll remember other things and you'll kind of go, like, oh, I guess that's why. Which I think is probably true. I mean, I've had some realizations um, about myself just in terms of, like, I don't know. I think I, I talked to you about this, but, like, uh, a lot of my EMDR stuff was focused on, like, memories with my dad especially. Um, and I think that definitely helped me, like, figure out how I felt in those moments and like mm -hmm. what beliefs you have about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized like in the last few weeks, actually, I was like, oh, I think, I think part of why I'm afraid people won't um, care about me is if I'm not a comedian is because that was kind of like taking that class with my dad was him like showing interest in me. And then he got like oh. very involved in my career. And before that I had felt some distance and there was some, you know, there's a lot of fighting and all these things. And then him like taking me to that class was like a thing we were doing together. It was like a concerted effort on his part to spend time with me. And he got really invested in my career early on and thought it was this cool thing. And like, oh, even now my parents are, yeah, even now my parents are really proud of it. Even if they don't like the material I do, they're like really proud of how successful I am. Mm. And so I think I probably carry that over to other relationships and other people and even on myself where I go like, well, if I'm not a comedian, that I'm not really worth oh. paying attention to. Oh, um, man. Which, again, that's not something we talk, I don't even think I talked to her about it in therapy, but I just, it kind of like popped up in my head one day and I was like, oh, I wonder, because, you know, I, I wonder why I feel that way mm. with people that like, this is the only worthwhile thing about me that oh, sets me man. apart, which is like, yeah. I could never make sense of that. And then I was like, oh, okay, that that checks out of that like deep rooted thing yeah um, absolutely and then you know also because it's what i've been doing my whole life but yeah that's like an example of hmm. you know going over a memory um 
that was difficult and figuring out why it made me feel the way I did long term. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's it, it's all connected. So, I mean, I don't know. I know some people in the group have done EMDR and I know some people on the Facebook group have talked about wanting to do it or being afraid to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I can say from personal experience, and I haven't done a ton of them. I mean, I've done like less than 10. Um, it's very intense and it is your whole day. Uh, and it can be very helpful, and but it's very draining mm-hmm. and it's very hard work. And yeah. at the end of every EMDR session, my therapist tends to go like, you're probably not gonna wanna come back here because this was so much. Oh, wow. But this is the time like you need to keep coming to therapy, which is nice. um is helpful. And, you know, I think that carries over to even like relationships and stuff where you're like, okay, mm-hmm. this is when it's hard, but you have to keep coming back and you have to keep showing up as Brene Brown says. Mm. Um, Cause you know, therapy is like a relationship with yourself. Yeah. You know, fostered by another person who's kind of helping you make sense of things. Right. Yeah. Um, so like what are the like what are the logistics of like what are the, are you laying down? Are you sitting up? Do you have wires on your head? Like I can't picture what this same, looks like. Yeah. yeah so I'll th- I'll tell you I'll tell you what I've had and then I'll read like more of a perfect a treatment description that we found online that's like maybe more technical. Um what it's been for me is that we, you know, we went over some memories that were painful for me first off. And then, you know, the next session we like picked one Mm -hmm. and they put like headphones on you and there's a beeping in each ear that is uh, going faster and faster. Um, And then you have two little things in your hands that like vibrate with the beeping. And during that time, your therapist is talking to you or my therapist talks to me and says kind of like, okay, now where are you? Like, has you closed your eyes? Says like, where are you? What are you doing? You know, what's happening? What are you feeling? And she's and, talking over the beeping. Um, at first, there's no beeping, and then she, you'll say something, and she'll go, okay, now focus on that. What you just said, focus on that, and really, you know, envision it and be in that place. And then the beeping will start, and it'll get faster and faster, and it'll kind of like work you up a little. It'll like work me up a little bit, and I'll kind of go like, okay. And I don't know if it's like partially meditative where it puts you in this kind of like meditative state where you really do kind of feel like you're back there and you, cause you want your body to be like, and so then she'll stop and she'll go now what's happening in your body. Like, how do you feel? And I'm like, Oh, my chest is really tight. You know, I feel scared. I feel panic, like those kinds of things. Mm. And, uh, and then like, she'll just go, okay, now focus on that. And then you focus on that and she keeps going with that. Uh, you go back to the beeping and the vibrating and then, you know, she'll ask more and more questions until you're crying pretty hard and things like, you know, what, what do you believe about yourself in that moment? Like mm-hmm. what, what does that make you think about yourself? And you go, Oh, it makes me feel worthless. And you go, okay, focus on that. You feel worthless. <laughs> and you're like, okay. Wow. And it starts beeping again. Wow. And then you go at one, there was one time where she said, um, she said, what would you say to, what would you say to yourself at that age? Like, what would you tell her now? And I was like, <laughs> like, you know, like, I don't know. It'll get better. Like that kind of stuff. Mm. And, uh, and then you're like, you feel like it's like five minutes. And then she's like, open your eyes. And you're kind of like, okay. And it's been like 25. Wow. Um, it's very weird. And there hasn't been one time that, and there have been times that I went in and I was like, I don't know if this is going to work today. Like, I feel fine. And it it always works. Like, it always gets me to, like, break down and feel very, like, I really, after every time, I do feel like a kid again mm-hmm. in, like, the most, like, gut-wrenching way. Um, but it has been helpful. And you do feel kind of, like, cleared out in a sense. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, like, she does a good job of being like, what you're doing here is really important and mm-hmm. it's really hard and you're doing a great job, like, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and just being like, you're back in a safe place. Everything's fine. And, uh, you know, there, I think there have been a couple times that she used like a safe place for me to picture that I could go back to to like calm myself down and whatnot. So, um, wow. this is what we read. This is a treatment description. Just so in case I forgot anything or in case it's like slightly different than what I've experienced. Uh, phase one, history taking session. So you assess the client's readiness and develop a treatment plan, identify targets for processing, including distressing memories and current situations that cause stress. Targets 
are set on skills and behaviors to improve the patient's future copy mechanisms. So that's her saying, what are some painful memories for you that you want to target here? Okay. Uh, phase two, ensuring the client has skills to handle emotional distress. The therapist may teach the client a variety of imagery and stress reduction techniques the client can use during and between session. Right. So, you know, picturing a place you feel safe, comfortable, you know, telling me to take a walk, telling me to, you know, drink water or go get whatever. Yeah. Um, phases three through six, a target is identified and processed using EMDR therapy procedures. These involve the client identifying three things, the vivid visual image related to the memory, a negative belief about yourself and related emotions and body sensations. So again, picture yourself, where are you, what's happening? Then, you know, what are you feeling in your body right now? And then what does it make you believe about yourself? Um, afterwards, the client identifies a positive belief. The therapist helps the client rate the positive belief as well as the intensity of the negative emotions. Right. So that could be, you know, you're doing a good job here. Um, after this, the client is instructed to focus on the image, negative thought, and body sensations while simultaneously engaging in EMDR processing using sets of bilateral stimulation. These sets may include eye movements, taps, or tones. The type and length of these sets is different for each client. At this point, the EMDR client is instructed to just notice whatever spontaneously happens. All right, so it sounds like I use, I don't do the tapping. I just use like tones and the like little vibrating things, which maybe is technically tapping. Mm. After each after each set of stimulation, the clinician instructs the client to let his or her mind go blank and to notice whatever thought, feeling, image, memory, or sensation comes to mind. Depending upon the client's report, the clinician will choose the next focus of attention. These repeated sets with directed focused attention occur numerous times throughout the session. If the client becomes distressed or has difficulty in processing, uh, in, pro in progressing, the therapist follows established procedures to help the client get back on track. And then finally, when the client reports no distress related to the targeted memory, she is asked to then think of the preferred positive belief that was identified at the beginning of the session. At this time, the client may adjust the positive belief if necessary and then focus on it during the next set of distressing events. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. So you have to get to a place where it's not a f that memory is not affecting you? I think like, that's the goal. Again, I haven't done it enough, okay. so I don't know that I've gotten to a place where we did it enough times where I was like desensitized to it, but okay. I'm sure that's part of it. Yeah. You feel like a sense of control and you're kind of like, okay. Right. And you identify those negative beliefs and just identifying the negative beliefs, I feel like helps you understand why you react to things a certain way, mm. which is like the first step in, you know, getting better or being able to better communicate what you need, like mm. right. because of your background and whatnot. So yeah. So that all lines up with. Wow. Uh, that's so interesting. Wow. I feel like my, therapist has done this kind of thing with me really? because she's a somatic therapist which is all about how your body um like absorbs whatever mental trauma yeah uh you've been through and so she's done this procedure with me but without any tones or tapping but it's like picture that you're there like we start off by her being like okay feel close your eyes and really feel your body in the chair so it's like you're becoming very physically aware of your body and your surroundings then it's like okay now go to that place now picture that you're there. Now actually say out loud like what was said to you or what you said in that moment. Hmm. Now how does that make you feel? What would you tell yourself in that moment? Like it's all yeah. – it, it sounds similar to this, but there's no tone. So it's not – I mean it's not this, but interesting how – I wonder what that like Venn diagram is with somatic therapy and um, EMDR. Yeah, hmm. that sounds very similar. Hmm. Um, so just a little background on uh, the creator of EMDR, Francine Shapiro. In 1987, Francine Shapiro was walking in the park when she realized that eye movements appeared to decrease the negative emotion associated with her own distressing memories. She assumed that eye movements had a desensitizing effect, and when she experimented with this, she found that others also had the same response to eye movements. She realized that eye movements by themselves did not create comprehensive therapeutic effects, and so she added other treatment elements, including a cognitive component, and developed the standard procedure called eye movement desensitization. Uh, since the initial studies were published in 1989, hundreds of case studies have been published. These studies have demonstrated EMDR's effectiveness in PTSD treatment, and EMDR is now recognized as effective in the treatment of PTSD. It's mm -hmm. really cool. I mean, mm -hmm. it's kind of... That's kind of miraculous that she yeah. was just walking in a park and realized this, and then it became something that actually does right. 
But are you moving your eyes a lot, Taylor? Like that? I mean, it maybe like under my eyelids. I don't know. Right. She's like, never talked to me about that, so I don't know. That's what's so interesting. It sounds like you're hearing stuff, you're feeling stuff, you're talking about stuff. But like, where do the eye- eyeballs come in? Well, yeah. I wonder if yeah. as you're hearing the tones and each ear and the vibrations are happening i right. wonder if that does make your eyes kind of move back and forth yeah, because probably. they're like trying to seek that Weird. sound seek that feeling i'm oh, not sure wow fascinating um so a case study with ED- emdr uh mike was a 32 year old flight medic who had completed two tours in iraq he had been discharged from the army due to his post-traumatic stress disorder and was divorced with a two-year-old son. When Mike arrived for EMDR therapy, the first session reviewed his history and prepared him for ED- EM. Oh my god, I keep messing this up, guys. EMDR treatment. It's hard to say. Um, the preparation phase provided Mike with a technique to use to access a positive state of safety and calm. He identified ten distressing target events related to his service as a combat medic. He also described a childhood incident that occurred when his father informed Mike at a age seven years, seven years old, that he was moving away, separating, separating from his mother, and that Mike would now be the man of the house responsible for his mother. All of these memories were directly addressed in subsequent sessions. After several weeks, Mike noted how the session had changed him as though he was wearing a different pair of glasses. The treatment addressed Mike's belief instilled when his father left during childhood that his role was to be responsible for the well-being of others. Ah. While training to be an army medic at um, Fort St. Sam Houston, Mike was taught if you don't do your job, people die. In his mind, he unconsciously reversed that to be if people die on you, it means you did not do your job. By the end of the session, Mike had realized that the soldier's death was not his fault and that he could let go of the burden of responsibility. He said, I feel lighter. The session also changed his feelings about what had occurred. Instead of feeling shame and guilt, he said, I can carry the memory with pride. Wow. Wow. So that is, I mean, yeah. so you're basically getting PTSD treatment. Is this what this mm-hmm. is like? This is what it's exclusively for PTSD I or do they so, do? Yeah. Well, not, wow. I mean, I think any distressing memory. Okay. Uh, so any kind is, of but yeah, PTSD, I think especially. Yeah. Wow. Any sort of trauma that you need to reprocess so that it's not um, informing how you feel about yourself wow. or the world anymore. Um, wow. so when so. you do it and then you have, you have to leave on a positive note, I'd imagine, like, do you have to say nice things about yourself or does your therapist say nice things about you? Cause my therapist like- tends to say nice things about me. She's just okay. like, you're doing a really good job and okay. you know, all these different yeah. things. Cause so. I imagine if you go back to like a negative memory and then you're just like in that state for a while, mm-hmm. like that could be very challenging to kind of snap out of too. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. How do you come is. out of that? Like you go there <laughs> um, and I'd imagine that takes a little while, right? Yeah. You might be kind of weepy the rest of the day just mm. like really raw or yeah. whatever and kind of like out of it you may need some space i've yeah. had that where i'm like okay i gotta walk around i don't know what to do i think after like the first one or two i there was one that was hard and i called my sister and she like came out to la because i was just like hey like i really need to see like you know just you gotta gotta you gotta like sit with it for a minute and yeah. let yourself like go through it which is like mm-hmm. the worst but mm-hmm. um yeah, I mean, I think it helps. I mean, anything that helps you, like, understand yourself better is probably right. a good thing. And right. I, I can only imagine, like, for people with really horrific, horrific traumas yeah, um, that aren't just emotional but physical, mm-hmm. um, how that that affects them and how, you know, that can just be really, really intense. Yeah. Um, so, you know. Yeah. Well, it's so, I mean, hearing – this case study of this guy, Mike, it's just fascinating how these really intense situations in our life, we can boil down to a sentence that we (sighs) unconsciously tell ourselves over and over and over. And then that creates a domino effect for the rest of our life. Yeah. Yeah. Because we've identified a certain way that is often not true. And then it's affecting everything we do. Um, Like the fact that once he was able to kind of unpack that whole if people die on you, it means you didn't do your job. Once you mm-hmm. could break that down and go, no, that's not true. It completely changed his perspective on his time in Iraq. I mean, that's such a huge thing. Yeah. To instead of feeling shame and guilt, he said that he can be proud. Like, mm-hmm. I'm like, oh my God, we should all do this. Everybody should be doing this. Yeah. yeah. And like being drawn to being like a medic. It's yeah. That's probably why he was drawn to it in the first place. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting. Yeah, all these things that happen when we're kids in childhood. Yeah, yeah they really shape us. 
We just want to say thank you again to our sponsor this episode, BetterHelp.com. You guys know we've talked about them before. They're so incredible. It's professional and affordable counseling. It's through an app. So you get matched with the counselor who's right for you and you get to communicate through your phone. So there's text, chat, phone, and video. You can start communicating with somebody in under 24 hours. Uh, You do have to be 18 or older, but it is available worldwide. Um, You can send messages with a counselor 24-7, 365, schedule video and phone sessions. Uh, And it's easy to change a counselor if you need to. I know that's always a big concern people have, but super easy with BetterHelp.com. This is a proactive mental health source, not a crisis line, and financial aid is available. So if you guys are looking to get into some therapy, BetterHelp is here for you. Use our custom link at www.betterhelp.com slash selfhelpless. That's betterhelp.com slash selfhelpless. Now back to the show. Probably a good exercise for everybody to do is to think about like what are some of the hard times in your life that have made you think a certain thing of yourself and like what do you carry with mm-hmm. you and how does that impact other things mm-hmm. yeah what keeps popping up or and sometimes you don't even know that's the other right thing. sometimes you go well this is pretty hard or you don't think about it a lot and like somebody sitting down and asking you what would what would you say are traumatic memories you've had mm-hmm. and um if you're able to identify those and then she like after the first session that we did that she was like if you remember anything you know think about it and that just makes you go back through and you go like even if it's nothing like horrible Mm -hmm. like even if it's just something someone said yeah that you process differently like uh you know somebody saying you know you gotta move on from this or whatever like remember someone had said that to me about um my mom dying where they were kind of like, well, you know, you don't want to be like so-and-so who never got over it. Like you want to be able to live your life and like, you know, you can't let it. Well, and they're not like, you know, in in a way I understand the, the meaning behind it. It's like, you can't let this thing control the rest of your life and you can't let it make you like, you know, fall into this dark place where it's all you're thinking about all the time. Um, But I think I was too young and I just took it as like, you need to get over this. Otherwise, you're a weak person. So I think, mm. and that was something I I thought about that I don't even think we went over it in EMDR because it wasn't like, it wasn't like this long memory to go through. It was just like, oh, something I remembered that was said to me that I was like, oh, that makes sense why I feel kind of like, you know, ashamed when I get sad about it because mm. I feel like mm. it happened so long ago. Like you need to move on and you're not this person or like feeling shame about using things to cope with you know pain of just like yeah back to like that addictive stuff i was talking about where you don't want to be addictive to any i was talking about it on the last episode i think but um yeah it's the episode that comes out next week we've oh kind of next week yeah sorry we're, we're all over the place yeah. but yeah me feeling like a very addictive person and somebody who can um rely on things too easily or people you know um i feel like that probably comes from you know feeling like that void and then the fear of not wanting to fall into that is like okay why well, I, I know that there are people who had something traumatic like that happen and then they like started drinking and like that's what they used or like they started doing drugs and then that's what they used to get through it and like mm. it's it's scary to me the idea that i could be that person also i'm just very emotional and i feel things very deeply so when i'm like going through something difficult i really feel every shard of it yeah and all this other stuff comes up and you're just like oh man and like the emdr stuff has made it easier for me to identify traumatic memories that maybe aren't even like specific memories but are just like a recurring thing that happened in my childhood yeah where i go like oh that's probably why like um you know i'm so afraid of to like trust people or or you know, feel abandoned or whatever, because we had, you know, all these nannies growing up that stayed for like eight months to a year and then they were gone and they always said they'd keep in touch and that they loved us and then we Mm. never heard from them again and they would just disappear Mm. because they were fired or they had a baby or they got married or like moved on with their life. And so I, and I hadn't thought about this until the last few weeks of like, oh man, like I just, I just got used to that. And I remember by high school, I was like really mean to whoever they hired. Cause I was just like, you're not going to be here. Like there's no point in me getting to know you, getting attached to you and you're lying oh. to us and you're being really careless because you haven't done this before and you're 24 and you think 
that you're gonna be here forever and you're gonna keep in touch with us and you think you love us. But what you're doing is you are, you know, giving us something to count on every day and you're gonna be gone soon and you need to, I was like, you need to have a degree of separation is like what I was saying. And I remember there was like mm. one one girl who was just like, couldn't believe that she was just like, no, I love you guys. And then she went and had a baby and she never talked to us again. Right. And you're mm. just like, I told you. Yeah. I told you and you just feel dumb every time. So I feel like in relationships when that happens, I'm just like, oh, I knew this. I knew that was coming. You know, I should have known I'm dumb. I've been through this before. I've been here before. And so that's all mixed in oh, with the abandonment. Oh. So again, all that probably from therapy, from EMDR, just being more, it it trains your brain to go, okay, where is this coming from? Why is this so hard? Why is this so painful? Um, why do I have this belief about myself when bad things happen that I deserve them and this is how my life goes, you know, mm. in whatever area that is? Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, I think there were some people talking in the Facebook group about it a while ago about how they were going to try it or um, they were curious about it or maybe they were starting and – uh yeah if it's if it's something that your therapist brings up or you can even bring it up to your therapist i don't know if like every therapist does it or if maybe it's it sounds like it'd be a specialist right maybe i don't know know. but yeah i would i would encourage you guys to look into it especially again if you have like really traumatic memories you're dealing with because i'm sure you know there are people who are dealing with stuff much worse than i have and it's well i mean it sounds like it can't hurt, right? It sounds no. like yeah. it's, you know. Yeah, everybody's got stuff, yeah. Yeah, and um, I feel like it has probably led to some good stuff for you as far as conversations that you've had, you know, with family and stuff. Mm-hmm. You think that was maybe part of it? Yeah, like, I think that helps. Brings it to the forefront a little bit or? Yeah, just working through that stuff yeah. and kind of like facing it head on. Right. And like putting yourself back there instead of like it flashing every once in a while when you mm. kind of like get a flash bulb memory and you go like, uh, okay, I can't. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. It's, it takes, I think tremendous courage to do what you're doing. And yeah. it's like, people don't want to face that. It's mm-hmm. a lot easier to just push it down and not think about it. So yeah. You know, yeah. I commend you. Yeah. yeah. And it helps. I think it helped me like forgive certain people for things too. Mm. I don't know, I don't know why, but I think in some cases I was like, because it, it is like re-experiencing it all over again. And you're like, oh my God, why would you do that? Mm. But then, I don't know, in, in reprocessing it, you feel better about it. And so it's not like a sore point anymore. You can like reframe it as, okay, that's a mistake someone made or that's, you know, an experience that was taken out of context or that's a memory you you have made into something. right larger than it needs to be or or whatever it just makes you think about it more so you can understand maybe the other people's perspective and your own and yeah because where you were at you're like analyzing it with it with an adult brain now right like you're looking at these things Mm -hmm. that affected you as a kid but now you're an adult maybe you've even had parallel experiences where it's like oh i've done something similar in a situation now Mm -hmm. i kind of get that person where as a kid you don't really have some of that to go off of right yeah oh man Mm -hmm. and you have a better way of going like okay that wasn't malicious maybe it was careless Mm -hmm. and maybe it wasn't super responsible certain things but it's also like you know but yeah again if you're at the age they were too like yeah. in those situations where they're in their 20s and, you know, they got their lives. It's just a job for them. It's like, yeah, that was painful to just feel like a job to people. Right. But and to get that to be like your source of like more like maternal care in some cases. Mm. Um, but, you know, nobody was doing it to you necessarily. It was just right. the circumstance and the situation. Right. So that kind of helps you like accept it and go like, all right, well, that's shitty. But at least like. It, I think that is what helps you like try and trust people more because you go like, okay, nobody's trying to hurt you. Like they're going to, but nobody's trying, which is, that's kind of comforting, right? Yeah. And it's not, it's not intentional or malicious. It's just, right. now I'm trying to think, cause I was a nanny for so long. Like, God, did I scar some children oh, no. by leaving? You know what I mean? But how long were you, I mean, were you there like every single day Yeah, for a year? Like, I almost, mean, uh, one was almost a year every single day for How little were they? Seven 
ish. Okay. We still um, email each other on our birthdays because we share the same birthday. Oh, that's sweet. So she oh, actually, yeah. her and her mom usually reach out to me on my birthday, which is always so sweet. Um, I think the first year maybe I did, but yeah. Um, and when you left, were you like, you were like, bye? Like, um, like, or, it was or, or were you just gone? That was hard. You get attached to those kids. Even yeah. if they drive you fucking nuts, ah, like yeah. you really get attached to them. Yeah. I mean, I was... I was picking her up from school and I was making her dinner and I was giving yeah. her a bath and I was reading and doing homework with her and I was, you know, like, um, yeah, you get attached and I, and for other families too. Um, I also nannied a couple other girls. Um, I did tutoring with one of the girls. Um, yeah. So you, it's like you become like an aunt or yeah. something, you know, and Sometimes you pick them up from school and they had a really bad day and you have yeah. to try to cheer them up and like maybe somebody said something mean to them, you know? Yeah. It's like you're kind of you feel yeah. like a little bit of a part-time mom. I mean, I'm yeah. I'm not doing all the big stuff, but it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, I'm doing the, the cooking and the laundry and I'm taking care of her homework yeah. and I'm talking to her and helping with projects. But yeah, you do you get attached, but at the end of the day, it's not your kid. Right. Even if you wanted to see them or something, there's also yeah. boundaries. You're not part of their family. Right. You know, even, even if the family is very nice and they're inviting you to the birthday parties and you're, it's like, you know, it's not, I, maybe some people get, get closer and they're like, yeah, I'm going to come over this weekend, just hang out, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I think I think it's important to also keep boundaries. And you also yeah. don't really know what your parents are saying to the nanny. And what kind of stuff, like, yeah. there's a professional dynamic with me and the parents, too, yes. where it's like, these things are fine to do and these things are not fine to do. So, mm-hmm. you, you know, it's like, so you, you kind of have to take that into account, too. It's right. It's like, you know, yeah. they could, people could very well say, look, look, when you leave here, it's probably best not to keep in touch because we don't want the kids to be upset. Right. Or, you know, point, oh, please yeah. do. Please call us anytime. Like, it's just yeah. like. It's a yeah. Right. It's, it's an interesting dynamic though, because mm-hmm. you're, you're like a part of these people's lives, right? And our yeah. a lot of our nannies did not have like professional boundaries. Like they would, a lot of them would like talk shit on my parents. What? Yeah, a lot of them would talk shit on my parents. Oh, that's weird. Jesus. Yeah, that's weird. There was one of them when my stepmom got cancer. She laughed. What? Yeah. Oh okay. my well, that's, god. That's yeah. something else I know. happening. That so there's a lot going weird. on of like you know you don't feel super connected to your parents. Your mom's dead. These women are here. They're going to oh. leave and come and go. Oh, and they're wow. like talking shit on the people who oh my God. are supposed to love you. So there's a lot anyone? going on. Oh, yeah. 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 So there's a lot. So no then when you do trust people. Yeah. So then when you do trust people and they disappoint you or they lie to you or whatever, you're like, oh, OK. So this is how people treat me. Like you're like, this is what I am supposed to. This is as good as I can get, I guess. Like I, oh, I am worthless. And it's not a mistake they made. It is something that I am just going to have to accept in how I'm treated. And it's like hard to feel like you deserve better than that. And then when you do feel like you deserve better, you almost get really angry because you're like, oh my God, I made it so clear that I deserved more than this, or I couldn't do this, or why this was so important. And, you know, people make mistakes and like people mess up and people don't get it and people have their own experiences that don't you know maybe things don't sink in as much but um yeah it's it's really it's really shitty to go back through all of it in therapy but it it is helpful to kind of sort it out and go like okay all you can do really um with your trauma is like if there are going to be things that trigger you, you can explain them to the people who love you Mm -hmm. so that they know, you know, Hey, this is like, this is, this is like maybe a mistake to a lot of people. But if it happens multiple times with me, like I, I'm going to self-destruct a little bit and it's because of all these reasons. Mm -hmm. And if those people don't listen to that or they don't, you know, think it's as important as you said, like, that feels really hard like that's hard to accept because it feels again it feels like telling those women like hey you're not gonna be here forever and you can't like tell us how much you love us and shit like it's not Mm. you can't just you're gonna take off like and then they go no 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 and then they do so it's uh and again it's it's very complicated because again Mm -hmm. it's not no one wants to be a nanny forever like of course you're not gonna stay with a family for 10 years i mean i'm sure some people do but um 
with that, there's just a lot rolled up into it. And like yeah. not, and not a lot of people had that many. Like I had, I think we counted once and it was like 11 or something. Wow. That's or, like that's a new one every lot. year, basically. Uh, yeah. 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 That's a lot. That's yeah. A lot. So, you know, there was, there was that. And, uh, you know, it's different where sometimes people are like, okay, we both have to work for a year and we need a nanny. You know, like it's not a normal thing. That's just like, this is who takes mm -hmm. care of you. This this six month period. But, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so it's all, you know, and if you're doing EMDR and there are days like you can't handle it or you can't take the time off that day, like if you have it, if you have therapy at three and you got to go to dinner with your parents at five, like maybe don't do that that day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like take care of yourself and know, um, know what you can handle and what your limits are. And sometimes you don't know until you do it. Um, and again, it depends on the severity of what you're reimagining because right. again, it's not like I'm going back through, you know, someone attacking me physically or anything like Still, that. Still though, don't dismiss your trauma. Right. Yeah. 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 But yeah, I just, really I think shit. about, you know, people having to go back through that shit and I'm just like, oh my God, oh, that yeah. sounds awful. All so sounds awful. Yeah. yeah. Um, should we wrap up with a couple of segments or we sign it off? Um, what do you guys think? Probably sign off. Right? Probably sign off. Yeah. I just want to say real quick, so this episode um, is coming out on July 29th, but we did just record two episodes, one that's coming out next week and a Patreon that's also coming out the same day next week on August 5th. And um, I I think I don't think we have said it since it happened, um, but I got married and I did a whole like kind of deep dive into stuff on the Patreon episode that comes out next week. So it's stuff that... I didn't want to talk about publicly on the podcast, um, but I just wanted to say, because I feel like I've gone into it in the next podcast as well. It was amazing, and it was so much fun, and thank you guys for all the sweet um, comments on Instagram. But yeah, there's there's really no better time to join Patreon. It's a bunch <laughs> yeah. of juicy shit. So, yeah. so go join patreon.com slash selfhelpless if you want to join uh, our show there. Yeah, I recently talked to Bi. I addressed all the hate mail I received uh, about the vegan plant-based episode. Yeah. So uh, I talked about that on Patreon. I'll probably continue to put little nuggets on on patreon until we do a another episode on the main show with uh, a doctor or a nutritionist or environmentalist or whoever we have on the show yeah but yeah that was a bag of fun everyone thanks <laughs> yeah. so much thanks for listening <laughs> I actually do dish on trust on the Patreon about certain wedding guests. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's the true. Trust, the trust talk continues. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, the wedding was amazing. Uh, yeah. Yes, it was. It was so much fun to have you guys there. <laughs> Delaney married us. Oh, yeah. That's like good shit. Good married job. Kane and Kelsey. What a dream. <laughs> <laughs> she was the best efficient in the world. Crushed it. Real tight crushed set. Crushed it. <laughs> Real tight set. Yeah. One I liner. One liner. One liner. It was, it was so much fun. It was great. So anyway, there's more talk of the wedding on Patreon and then in the upcoming episode. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Do you guys right. want to plug your dates for this one or did you guys? .com. Yeah. Yeah. Just go on there. Uh, so. Yeah. Go to KelseyCook.com uh, for tour dates. We've we are we're spent. We recorded three episodes today, you guys. Yeah, so we we are, haven't done that since like we started the podcast. We are yeah. sleepy geese. Yeah. But yeah. Delaneyfisher at gmail.com. Awesome. Shoot me an email about consulting <laughs> if you're into that. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. 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 You guys, we love you so much. Thank you for supporting Self Helpless. You can follow us on social media, on Instagram and Facebook, at Self Helpless Podcast. And you can visit selfhelplesspodcast.com for all things Self Helpless. Learn about Patreon and how to sign up. Our merch is there. Information about our Facebook group and how to join. All the episodes you can listen to are on there. A little bit about the show. Our individual sites are linked there. And our contact information, email, and P.O. box if you want to send us some love letters. And yeah. you can follow us individually as well. I am at Delaney Fisher on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And DelaneyFisher.com where you can watch my docu-comedy special, Love at First Cousin, for free. And then DicksByDelaney.com if you want to buy some dick mugs. Sweet. I'm at Kelsey Cook Comedy on Instagram, at Kelsey Cook on Twitter, KelseyCook.com for all tour dates and merch. And my album, Savor It, is still available to buy on iTunes. And you can watch Wrists of Fury, my foosball web series that has an episode of Taylor and Delaney uh, on the All Things Comedy YouTube channel. And I am at Taylor Tomlinson on Twitter and Instagram and ttomcomedy.com for my Netflix special and all live tour dates. Sweet. We yeah. love you guys. So much. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>